Hi everyone, my name is Caitlin Roper from Collector Shout for a World Free of Sexploitation. And uh, I'm here with my colleague and friend Melinda Tankard Reist from Collector Shout. And we're going to be talking today about my book, Sex Dolls, Robots and Woman Hating, which was published by Spinifex Press last August. And uh, so Melinda and I have been working together at Collective Shout for about 13 years. We've built it together. We've had a really long history of feminist campaigning and organizing together. So it's really special to have MTR here with me to be able to talk about my book and also about her book, which came out about a month before mine, because it's been really apparent as we, we've had our books published and talked about them and and gone into detail and seen that there's so many parallels between our books. So I thought it'd be a good idea to have MTR to join me today so we could have this conversation. So yeah, it's really special to be able to do that. So thank you very much, Joe, for the opportunity. And thanks to everyone who's here and joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here with you too, Caitlin, and to have the chance to talk about our, our books together. There's so many parallels, so many similarities. So uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Joe, for having us here together. So should we start maybe um, just kind of looking at... Sorry, to ask you. <laughs> Caitlin, how about you read uh, an extract from your book? And Why, sure. People can see how wonderful it is and how amazing and how uh, disturbing, of course, as well. I'm still disturbed reading the manuscript uh, when I did. So uh, why don't you, yeah, give our uh, listeners a bit of a, a feel for, for what's in the book. Sure. So I'll read um, the opening of chapter one, which is called Real Men and Unreal Women. So it's just how I start the book. She is seated, dressed in sheer black lingerie and knee-high stockings, her long, wavy hair falling over her face. The sounds of the crowd can be heard in the background and men stand around waiting for their turn. A sign nearby reads, Blowjob Robot, Try It. It is a 2019 adult video news expo, the annual trade show for the porn industry held in Las Vegas. Miss Doll Swallow, billed as the first oral sex robot in the world, is the feature in a live demonstration. A man holding a dildo approaches, sweeping her hair out of her face. With her head robotically bobbing up and down, he inserts the dildo in her mouth. It can go faster, he tells onlookers. He turns back to the robot and says, go faster. The robot follows his instructions. And it can go even faster, he boasts. The robot speeds up again, uttering the words, yes, master. Photos from the event show grinning men taking their turns, testing the robot with the dildo and posing for pictures. One man wearing a Pornhub t-shirt poses with his head back and eyes closed, feigning sexual pleasure carefully positioning himself so it appears the robot is performing oral sex on him and not the dildo he is holding. Another image shows the female body robot on the chair with one man manipulating its body and another holding a dildo to its lips and other men standing around watching. It looks eerily reminiscent of a gang rape scenario. The robot speaks every now and then saying, come on baby, here it is. And sex is fun, yes master. The men are smiling and laughing. They are having a good time with this replica woman manufactured to sexually service men like them. Watching men bonding over replicating scenarios of violation and humiliation on this female bodied robot, the inherent misogyny of sex dolls and robots is undeniable. She is not really a she, but an it. Sex dolls and robots are objects, but they are not neutral. They are an expression of woman hating. These products could only be conceived of in a society in which women are seen as less than human, as mm -hmm. things for men's sexual use and gratification. It's no coincidence that sex dolls and robots are overwhelmingly made in the likeness of women for men's sexual use rather than the other way around. Mm. Caitlin, it must have been really hard for you to write this book. Uh, how did you do it and, and how have you got through it in, in one piece? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, in terms of writing the book, I actually, I, I was angry a lot, which is probably no surprise, just as I was doing this research and reading the things that men had to say about these dolls and the dolls that they had and and all of this, but mm -hmm. that it was actually useful to be able to take this information and 
put it down in words and, you know, to make an argument against it, it felt like I wasn't just having to absorb what I was reading and just carry it, but that I was taking it and turning it into something that could be used, you know, to leverage against what I was saying. So it sort of felt um, satisfying to be able to write and think like, this is a weapon against that, like what I'm writing. So yeah. that really helped just being able to. Your rage fueled. fueled yeah, it really did. Fuel. And that's mm -hmm. how it is with a lot of my work and for, for you as well, I think just where, you know, permanent state of kind of rage, yes. but you turn it into something and that makes it not just rage that you carry. But I mean, MTR, you know, we joke sometimes about this angry Kermit gif and it's angry Kermit typing. He's kind of typing like this. And that's yeah. how I wrote this book. Like, it was basically just me furiously typing. Yes. And <laughs> yeah. Was there anything particularly shocking, distressing to you? I mean, you've been working on the issue of sex dolls and robots for quite some time, but was there anything you came across where you thought, I've just got to take some time out, debrief, get some help to deal with? you know, the level of, of depravity um, and women hating that, that you encountered while, while doing the research? Uh, for sure. There were a lot of things that were very difficult. I think the thing that really got to me the most was, I guess, just the realisation when we're talking about sex dolls and sex robots modelled on women's bodies or, you know, okay. surgically enhanced bodies, but mm -hmm. these these products, which are replica women, mm -hmm. just the the level of misogyny that was so inherent in these products, and and the way that so many men would act like that was normal or appropriate, or that it's just like oh, if you can't find a girlfriend, just go get a replica woman, and that's the same thing. It just just the realization I had it over and over again: this is what they think of us. This yeah. is how men see us. They see us as you know just objects existing for their use and just something to be penetrated and they really think yeah. that like a piece of plastic in the shape of a female mm. serves the purpose of women that it's that we're mm. interchangeable with objects so just having that realization again and again and again whether it was from sex doll sellers or the men who own sex dolls or and the one that actually really got to me the most was when male academics are promoting these you know, sex dolls saying, oh, you know, they could be really good for health and well-being, and they could be used by men with disabilities and who are elderly and who aren't getting um, the kind of sex they want at home. Maybe they want sadistic, violent sex or to sexually abuse children, and they're saying these dolls are a really great thing for that. So just from those men to, you know, these are men in academic positions. They're seen as, you know, intelligent people and you know these men a lot of them they're shaping policy and the way we think about these things and how these issues are framed and I was furious at these men because I just thought these men are the same they believe women are things they believe we're interchangeable yep. and they're perpetuating the objectification of women and you know men's violence against women mm -hmm. and they think that's okay because the most important thing is the male sex right and that's what they're communicating. So that make, that was really infuriating. Well, you shred their arguments completely, Caitlin. Do you want do you want to give us a two or three dot point responses to how you did take those arguments apart in the book about you know sex dolls serving a purpose, uh, helping men, companions, reducing sexual assault, etc. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot there, but I guess the first argument that I made is because these are very much promoted as companions, which which I found really interesting, right? They're not usually being promoted as sex toys. They're being promoted as the ideal woman or your perfect girlfriend or doll wives or silicon wives. So they're really being promoted as stand-ins for women. Mm -hmm. So the first thing there is just to come back to reality and say, these are objects these are objects that are being used in place of women. And the argument is, you know, that an object is the same as a woman, but you can't have a relationship with a thing, with an object. It doesn't work like that. There's no intimacy. There's no mutuality. You're not having a relationship with an object that you own. Mm -hmm. So that's the first 
major thing because we see that sort of idea you know from the academics we see all the time in media so and so guy is in a relationship with a sex doll and I just think we need to be like no no he's not that's that's complete fiction it's made up it's not real and um yeah sorry what was the rest of the question (laughs) oh yeah just the way that you've dealt with those those claims about the benefit about the benefits and almost you know performing a public service performing a a benefit for for humanity right yeah when they say here's all the benefits my big question is okay for who and it's always the benefits are for men and the benefits come down to that men have on-demand unlimited sexual access to a replica woman and that's the benefit Mm. like that's all it is when they say oh you know elderly men or or they don't even say men they say people but but the market is just about completely men these products are overwhelmingly bodied it's it's like the the same sort of gender dynamics as the sex trade so I call them out on that I say they're taking a gender neutral approach to to this issue which they are they're talking Mm. about you know the needs of Mm. elderly people or disabled people Mm. or people who you know, in a partnership have a higher sex drive than their other partner and are entitled to more and have violent, sadistic, abusive sex. And I'm like, I wonder which people they are referring to. Yes. And the book does show that very, very strongly that uh, so many men desire violent, sadistic, abusive sex. And you quote one doll owner saying, if my doll would just struggle a little bit, I'd be in heaven it's quite revealing, isn't it? They want resistance. They want the conquest, the taking, the domination. Uh, you tell a story about a uh, sex doll convention where uh, and, and what men do to a, a, a display model model doll. Do you want to tell us more about that as an insight into what some men actually really want? Yes, there was um, some news reporting a couple of years ago after um, there was a convention with a sex doll that was featured and the doll was left broken um, and soiled because of what the men were doing to it. But this Mm. isn't um, sort of a standalone story. Like there's been more and more reports over the last couple of years where it's actually become an issue for police now where they're finding what appears to be um, female corpses that have been discarded And then it turns out that it's actually a sex doll. And this Mm -hmm. is happening a lot. They're being dumped in bushland and rivers, just Mm -hmm. all over the place. And they're often found headless, mutilated, ripped apart. And Mm -hmm. people are are finding these dolls and believing they're actual women and children and being very distressed by that. But it shows you how the men, how some of these men are using the dolls and that violence and their desire to enact violence is often a key Mm -hmm. component. And I do write about that um, quite a bit in the book. Mm-hmm. I wonder, Melinda, if it's worth me doing a bit of a chapter overview. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And then kind of yeah. come back and see what stands out we want to talk about. Yeah. So um, in chapter one, which is uh, real men and unreal women, I basically just talk about the basics. So just sort of defining sex dolls and robots, the gender nature of the products and, and this trade mm-hmm. and looking at what is available. So there's the full size dolls, there's torsos and disembodied body parts so I look at all of that kind of content and really just the way that sex dolls are being marketed as companions so this kind of ideal customizable woman that you can pack away after and I also discuss um, I guess some of the theory the feminist theory around this so we look at sex dolls uh, functioning as the literal objectification of women as a backlash to women's rights Mm -hmm. and as a form of pornography and then in chapter two, I um, I examine the arguments from the sex doll and robot advocates and just expose and respond to their claims that these replica woman sex dolls for men's unlimited use are a good thing. Like one even says they are like a positive good. They should be welcomed. Like they're, they're not even saying they could be. They're unequivocally okay. arguing that this is a great thing. Uh, mm-hmm. They argue that they could alleviate loneliness. And I, I think I really respond to that concept as, as rubbish. They argue they could be used by the elderly and people with disabilities. And, mm-hmm. you know, and they, as I've said, they mean men, of course, they always mean men. Mm-hmm. 
and just these claims that they could promote health and well-being and ridiculous ideas like they could be used to teach sexual consent because how better to teach sexual consent than providing a literal object that does not respond mm -hmm. um, for men to use. Mm -hmm. And even this, this is kind of an interesting, I mean, it's still rubbish, but this interesting notion that, you know, some sex dolls are bad, therefore we just need more ethical or feminist sex dolls. And maybe we should come back to that because that probably heard warrants. that before. Yeah. That, yeah, I think that warrants further discussion. <laughs> and then um, in the third chapter, I situate sex dolls and robots within uh, a wider context of technologies that are used to facilitate uh, the violation and abuse of women. And I include some stories of a few uh, who have found out that there's sex dolls made in their likeness. Mm -hmm. And um, again, there's some parallels there between our books, which I'm sure we'll come back to MTR. Mm -hmm. Also looking at sex doll owners, what they're actually doing with the dolls, how they're using dolls to make their own pornography Mm -hmm. how some of them are enacting and practicing violence on their dolls mm -hmm. and scenarios of sexual assault, torture, predation, and dolls being broken and destroyed like I've touched on. Mm -hmm. yep. in, oh, sorry, go on. No, go on. Okay. In chapter four, I look at the parallels between the sex trade and the trade in female body dolls because there are a lot. A lot of the reasons buyers gave for purchasing sex dolls are the same reasons sex buyers gave for why they paid for sex. Essentially, it's it seems to be that the appeal is this endless sexual access to a pornified replica woman that never refuses, has no boundaries, just can't say no, and has no needs. Mm -hmm. um, basically, just, yeah, that men have this constant access without limitations and the complete control and I also um, look at sex doll brothels in that chapter as well. And then mm -hmm. in chapter five, I'm nearly done. <laughs> in chapter five, we, I look at how women are essentially being groomed to tolerate men's sex doll use. And I include the accounts of some women whose uh, husbands chose their sex doll over them. Mm -hmm. And women who felt powerless to object mm -hmm. and how the language of kink and kink shaming and sex positivity effectively silence these women by telling them you're not allowed to object it's his kink mm -hmm. if he yeah. likes it sexually you can't say anything mm -hmm. uh, also looking at the media uh, that's promoting and normalizing these products and modeling how women should respond like what's the progressive way to respond it's basically to be cool with it mm -hmm. uh, also media which paints men who buy sex dolls as just poor, lonely men just looking for companionship and they really, you know, they deserve our sympathy mm -hmm. and how this media serves to groom women for porn sex acts as well. Uh, and even, you know, men using their sex dolls as a baby step to try and coerce their wife into a threesome. Mm -hmm. Chapter six and seven are looking at child sex abuse dolls and Collector Shout, we've done a lot of work campaigning in this space, which I'm sure we'll come to shortly. So these are anatomically correct replica girls, toddlers, and babies with mm -hmm. penetrable orifices marketed for men's sexual use. Mm -hmm. And in this chapter, all these chapters, I look at what, uh, which products exist, uh, the legal status of them, and responding to arguments made by defenders of the products, including pedophile rights groups, and why these arguments are stupid. And also looking at our campaigns and victories in this space. Mm -hmm. And chapter eight is the conclusion, final one. Basically ask the question, if we don't act now, mm -hmm. what will the future look like for women and girls? Mm -hmm. What will the technology be? How will it have advanced? Uh, if it's normalized and accepted, how will these products be further utilized for rape, sexual abuse, mm -hmm. uh, har harassment of women, all you know the possibilities there. We have deep fakes. We have these products just you know, the possibilities really are endless. Mm -hmm. And even the possible legitimization of sex dolls as therapeutic tools, because we're being told all the time, you know, they could be good for therapeutic use, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. And the possibility that sex doll owners could be sort of seen as a stigmatized minority mm -hmm. uh, in need of um, legal protections, like mm -hmm. who knows. Mm -hmm. So after all that horribleness, I end the book with a bit of hope 
and mm-hmm. identify some of the women in the groups around the world who have been fighting in this space, who've been running campaigns and having victories, including Collective Shout. Mm-hmm. Um, and just a final appeal for people to speak out, just that it is really needed for people to to speak out now before we completely lose control of this issue. Can you tell us how the book has been received? Has it had much mainstream media coverage or has it been mainly our Radfem friends like we have here today that have given the book the attention that it deserves? Well, our radical feminist friends are always wonderful and reliable. And I have had a lot of interest from the radical feminists and some of the the best interviews and questions, the really insightful kind of questions, and I've appreciated that. There has Mm -hmm. been some mainstream media coverage, although it's typically more centred around the child sex abuse dolls because I guess that's everyone can get behind that issue, right? Like most rational people see that there's a problem with Mm -hmm. creating replica children for men to sexually Mm -hmm. abuse or practice sexually abusing. So like I said, there has been some interest, particularly in that sort of space, Mm-hmm. And I suppose around our campaigns as well. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so mm-hmm. we'll see how we go. Well, you've done Women and Girls a service producing this book, Caitlin. So thank you so much for putting yourself uh, through it. And of course, thanks to our mutual publisher, Spinifex Press, for being one of the very few brave f- publishers uh, around the world to really put into print such such horror in the hope that we can all act and and do something about it before it's too late. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, MTR. Hmm. So where should we pick up? There's a lot of strands there that we could. Yeah, well, perhaps uh, I could share a little bit about my book and then we can look at the intersections between the two. And that's something that came out very strongly for me when I was working on my book and reading your manuscript at the same time uh, was this overpowering uh, truth about uh, men wanting to possess women uh, and wanting to use them however they 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 wanted to use them for their sexual entitlement that came through very clearly the fact that the sex dolls are, are porn dolls they're porn dolls and the women in my book got treated like porn dolls as well uh, they many of the women in my book described feeling like a living sex doll so there was a lot of a lot of parallel uh, parallels there and also, the another theme I thought was about uh, the sex dolls and and the 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 real living women uh, having to be perpetually sexually available. Uh, the only difference was that the replica anatomically correct silicon versions of of women couldn't object, couldn't object. Uh, but also many of the women in my book felt they couldn't object either uh, because that's what porn culture has done, uh, totally disempowered women and their women are told they've got to provide whatever men want. But shall I read a, an extract from, from mine? Yes. At this point? Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, subtitled from the introduction, uh, Pornography Colonised Their Lives. The men consume porn everywhere, at home, in the garage, the shed, at work, in the car, in the work truck, on the plane, in the toilets at bus tour rest stops, multiple times a day, even when they were supposed to be looking after the baby. The women, and for those who were mothers, their children were collateral damage in their partner's insatiable greed for porn. The stories tell of the crushing of intimacy, of sex that was deadening, Sex became mechanical, quote, we only ever had porn style sex. We never made love, writes Maggie in the book. Respect, connection and love, the bindings that keep a relationship intact, unraveled. Porn colonised their union, their families and homes and seeped into every aspect of their lives, leaving women rejected and scarred and knowing they were being compared to other women and would never match up. They tried and tried thinking it was their failure. If only I could be a better wife, not provoke him. Oh, I'm not able to get to the next page. Okay. Well, I mean, there's a lot right there. Yeah, there is a lot right there. There's, a, there's enough right there for sure. 
Uh, but basically, pornography took over their entire lives. Uh, porn consumption changed the way that a partner related, uh, the man related to his partner. Women told of a total lack of respect for their boundaries and overblown sense of entitlement, expectations that they would provide sex on demand and participate in sex acts they found degrading and demeaning. A lot of women felt they had to provide a porn star experience. Another big theme was, was the violence. Uh, men really treating the women very brutally, wanting to enact the signature acts of uh, pornography, uh, choking and strangulation was a strong theme. Uh, some women uh, collapsed a as a result of being unable to breathe. One, one woman didn't know if she would um, survive. And so the scripts of the global porn industry were enacted on on real real women, and and that was that was particularly disturbing. So it's a collection of of twenty five personal accounts uh, telling the lived experience of real of re women with habitual porn consuming partners who who demand their right to porn uh, over the well being of their partners, their children, their their uh, relationships. So it was really designed to tell the truth about what porn does uh, to a relationship. Uh, there were two main aims. One was as a warning to younger women, uh, especially don't date men who use porn. A number of the women in the book say they wish they'd heard that advice earlier. And the other main aim of this book was to act as a permission giving uh, to women in the same situation. Women shouldn't have to sacrifice their lives for a man who's engaging in um, psychological, sexual, emotional, uh, physical abuse, and that they have a, a, a right to, to not be in that relationship. Uh, he doesn't deserve them. He's showing no signs of wanting to change at all. Why should she have to endure that? Why should she have to uh, live a second rate life and completely sacrifice herself uh, for him? Uh, so they were the two, two main aims of the book. I think that's so important, particularly just the permission giving. So like MTR uh, was proofreading my manuscript, I was also reading hers around the same time. Mm -hmm. And just to read these stories, they're, they're so profound and really tear you apart that you can just see how porn destroys women. We, we you know, we talk about the, the harm to women who are in the industry and we talk to the harm, you know, from, you know, women and girls who, what well, we look at the porn is obviously, you know, harms women in many ways, but I thought it was just to focus on the women who are harmed by their partners who are consuming porn and the harm to relationships was an important angle to look at. And the permission giving, like you said, because I can think of so many women, I think they need to read this book. Friends, people I know, people I care about, they need to hear these stories and they need to know that it's not just them because the parallels that I saw with the women whose partners chose or preferred their sex doll to them and the women in this book, it's the women who are thinking, what's wrong with me? Am I not good enough? And they're so distressed. And they also feel like because they're so humiliated and ashamed of that, they don't, it's really hard to talk to anyone about it or to say this is happening. But MTR, something that was really, I don't know if it was heartbreaking or just infuriating about the accounts in your book mm -hmm. is that so many times when women did reach out for help, when they spoke to a family member or to yep. a counsellor or a religious leader, the way that they, you know, what happened. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. The women felt completely uh, gaslit. They, when they tried to seek help, whether it was from friends, other women, counsellors, therapists, they were undermined. Rarely did they find support. They were told all men do this. This is normal. This is natural. Uh, you need to get drunk and loosen up a bit. You need to get that monkey off your back that tells you uh, that porn is bad. It's your prudery. It's because you're you're hung up about sex. This is just what men do. And uh, rarely did they find someone that encouraged them to, to leave. They're expected to endure uh, either having to provide sex 24-7 and sex they didn't want to provide, uh, or they were ignored. 
uh, because they could not compete with what their partners found in porn. And in the end, uh, they don't have a real, real relationship because any intimacy they might have had has been uh, stripped away because of his insatiable uh, demand for for pornography, even consuming it in the family home, even when kids are around. So that was um, particularly distressing, that level of undermining of women and the expectation that she should put up with it, she should endure it. It's up to her to keep the marriage going. Uh, you know, how much more should she have to endure really? So I do hope more women find strength from this book. And also that women are very particular about the type of therapists and counsellors they go to for advice, uh, because there's very few that seem to affirm uh, the, the woman and, and her right to be treated with dignity and respect and her right to end this relationship. There's very few looking at the relationship through a porn critical lens. It's, it's like the porn industry has just captured uh, the thinking of counsellors and therapists. They seem to think that porn can enhance a relationship despite the evidence. And uh, so then women just end up gaslit and, and, and undermined and, and, and not helped and feeling um, more alone and less supported than ever. And this notion as well that, you know, that, you know, men are using porn to coerce their partners into mm -hmm. unwanted sex. It's like, well, if you don't want me to look at porn, then you better be providing sex on, on demand whenever I want it. And women right. feeling like I've got to give him sex all the time. And that's right. even happening with the, the sex dolls. Women are saying, my partner says he wants to get a sex doll unless I'm going to be prepared to be made available to him all the time. She's like, well, you know, we have sex a few times a day already and he still wants a sex doll. Or if I'm not prepared to have kind of the porn style sex that he wants, he'll get a doll. And all the ways that, you know, men use right. their different kinds of porn to coerce yeah. women into sex acts they don't want. Well, a woman is not, uh, you know, she should not be his methadone. And often the men just use uh, that as a way of getting uh, even even more sex from their wives, but they don't stop using the porn, right? Mm. It's just it's just a myth. He gets more sex uh, with his wife while consuming porn, while purchasing uh, women, prostituted women in the sex industry. He doesn't actually change his behaviour. Uh, so one of the women in the book was providing sex even when pregnant up to four times a day. Mm. Did he change his behaviour? Not a bit. Not a bit. And he insisted on uh, strangling her. She uh, passes out. And then later she discovers um, an entire collection of, of child sexual exploitation material. Now, he continued to consume this material even when she was providing sex four times a day and even when heavily pregnant. So it's this myth that, you know, you give him enough sex, that'll cure him and he'll stop going for it elsewhere. It, it doesn't work like that. Certainly not uh, uh, with the women uh, describing their stories in, in this book. Um, yeah. Mm. Another thing that I've been thinking about, about that, the ways that women are silenced or gaslit mm. into sort of believing that this is normal, this is what they should be doing, and especially that, you know, the accounts from women when it comes to sex dolls and sex robots yeah. is that they're feeling that they can't actually object. Yes. And the language of sex positivity, all about kink and kink shaming and don't kink shame. Right. Women are literally in this position where their husbands are buying a pornified replica woman sex doll. That's and they're right. like, I can't say anything or else I'm the villain. That's right. And there was even one post that I found online. Well, I, I did find various posts online where women were expressing mm. privately their distress over these situations. Yes. One that really got to me was it was a post on Reddit and the woman posting about her experience with her partner and the sex doll and how deeply distressed she was. Mm. She opened with, I'm not kink shaming. And if any one of you in the comments kink shames, I'm going to report you. Yes, that's right. And I was just like, I... That's right. Like women policing themselves and policing other women. Like you can't talk about the distress you're feeling 
that your partner's purchased essentially a replica woman corpse That's to, right. on demand and you feel uncomfortable with that well you just need to be more open-minded why are you so anti-sex yeah. why are you kink shaming and this is the narrative we're seeing it all is. the time there was this tv show called dummy which was starring anna kendrick hmm. and basically in the show the scenario is and it's based on a true story it's based on reality hmm. this woman goes to her boyfriend's house and sees a sequin on the bed and she's like what is this are you, hmm. are you having an affair and he says, oh, I, I have a sex doll. And her immediate response is to say, oh, well, I don't want to kink shame you. Yeah, that's true. And I'm like, really? Yeah. That's what's, that's what's happening here. Women are saying, oh, if I'm going to be progressive and cool and open-minded, then I can't have feelings about this thing that I obviously have feelings about. And right. you, know, you have to say, who benefits from that when women who are taught to self-censor? Yeah. yeah, and police yeah. themselves. It's great for men. It's terrible for women. Absolutely. I wouldn't mind sharing a couple of stories that illustrate exactly what you're saying, oh. Caitlin. So, so Shani was accused of kink shaming. She said, I told myself that I would just grit my teeth and take it if it meant we could stay together because I love him and I don't want to lose this relationship. I thought perhaps I could get used to it if I just sacrificed myself and pushed out of my comfort zone, but I don't want it. It's not just a matter of gritting my teeth. I feel degraded on a deep level. It's my body and I don't want anyone putting anything in my anus. I'm a good lover. I love to please my partner, but what I'm willing and able to give should be enough. I don't want to feel like I'm not good enough, not doing enough, not trying hard enough in the bedroom. He accused me of kink shaming and made me feel like the bad one. And then there's, uh, so Shani is Australian. Then there's Amalia, who was our youngest contributor to the book. She's 31 and lives in the Netherlands. And she gives an insight from a relatively a younger woman and what it's like to, to experience porn sex in your 20s. She says, before meeting my new partner, I'd assumed anal sex was something only homosexual men engaged in. To my shock, my boyfriend told me he wanted to have anal sex with me. He found anal scenes in porn arousing. I couldn't make sense of anything anymore. What was happening? All I knew was that I would never be able to endure anal sex, not even for him. But how was I to keep this man as my partner if I didn't provide him with this specific act that he seemed to find the most arousing? I went online and I tried to find sources that would assure me that what he wanted to do to me was unacceptable and maybe even dangerous. Guess what I found? Tips on how to do anal sex for beginners. Quote, how to convince your girlfriend to do anal and countless voices saying it's totally normal. It's what a lot of men dream of. And you will be his queen if you allow him to do it. Uh, that reminds me of uh, one of the stories in the book uh, by the woman who I mentioned had uh, collapsed after being strangled after she came to. Uh, her partner described her as his queen because he had let her, him do this to her. You're, you're my queen. How could I love myself when no man would ever truly love me because I would never be able to give them what they see in porn? It's just a heartbreaking question. After discovering that violent, graphic, hardcore sex movies are not just a niche thing, but a seemingly normal thing almost every man who has internet access indulges in, I cannot trust any man anymore. I cannot take men seriously anymore. And can you, can you blame her? So yeah, women undermined. Uh, feeling they can't speak out and this is what the so-called sex positivity um, movement has done to women this is what the so-called sexual revolution has done to women women now have to conform to a pornified ideal about what they should provide and then it's it's all glossed up and presented to them uh, you know wrapped up as this is empowerment this is liberation well they don't feel that empowered or that liberated and certainly if they can't express uh, what they don't want to do, then there, there's there's no liberation to be found. Yeah, it's very depressing. And especially when you you hear more from those younger women. But I will say when you and I went to Philia last year yes. in Wales and heard, well, even just the fact that there were, were so many younger women there mm. at this conference. Mm. And as we heard from their stories, I mean, we heard terrible stories, mm. but I was so heartened to see there are young women here and they yeah. get it. Of course yeah. they get it. They lived it. They're living yeah. it. And But just to hear that young women are part of this movement and they're speaking out too, yes. and that, that was really 
I was really, I guess, relieved in a way to see that that's happening. Yeah. It's yeah. The young women are seeing it as it is and they're speaking out. Yeah. yeah. The number of young women that stood up in our sessions and shared their stories and the number of young women said that they were following our work, following the work of a collective shout. I was, was very encouraging wanting to stand up for themselves, wanting to enforce their boundaries, wanting to take, you know, collective action uh, globally against porn, the porn industry, sex dolls. Uh, well, it, it was very encouraging. And maybe that's a good segue into our campaigns, uh, Caitlin, and how we're engaging in this space. Uh, do you want to start with the work on the, against sex dolls and robots? And I could speak a bit to what we're trying to do in the porn, the porn space. Yeah, sure. So uh, Collective Shout, we are a grassroots campaigning movement against the sexualization of girls and the objectification of women. So we've run campaigns for how will be 13, 14 years now? MTR? Yeah, we're going into 14 years now. Yeah, yeah mm. so we've been running campaigns for a long time. We've had lots of victories on, on lots of different issues, whether it's sort of sexist and sexualized porn-inspired advertising, uh, whether it's uh, sexualized products for little girls, uh, against the porn industry or getting porn magazines shut down. Just, I can't even, you know, there's been so many campaigns and victories over such a long time that I really can't even remember them all just, just off the top of my head. But more recently, we've been running some campaigns on sex dolls or against sex dolls and, and those who are selling and profiting from the sale of sex dolls. So we've had some tell really us about Rod the Trady. You must tell okay. us about Rod the Trady. Rod the Trady slash sex doll influencer. So a few months ago now, Mamma Mia ran an article. So for those who don't know, Mamma Mia is Australia's biggest women's media outlet. So it's sort of like everything for women. And they ran an article about a man who calls himself Rod, a tradie and a sex doll influencer. Tradie uh, is Australian, it's short for tradesman. That's right, yes. Uh, so Rod owns a number of sex dolls and it was basically a piece about how Rod is in a relationship with his sex dolls and it's a really sympathetic kind of piece like oh poor Rod he had his heart broken by a cruel woman because women are terrible and um, now he has his sex dolls and he's so happy and isn't it it's not hurting anyone and it's really harmless and you know it's not really about misogyny and objectification because he loves these replica women that he owns and uses for sex on demand uh, and then also quoted um, this piece quoted owners from a couple of different sex doll companies. So it really was quite openly advertising sex dolls and it even included like direct links to these men's online shops. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so the piece was just full of myths and crap about, you know, pro sex doll propaganda. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so we responded, we, we objected and we said, you know, this is rubbish. Here's what we're finding. And, and I said, I've just written a book on this and this, this is what I found. And it's really harmful to to promote these objects that are, you know, all, um, you know, promoting male violence against women and men seeing women as things to be used. And is that really something that you want to be promoting as this, you know, women's media outlet? So they published a piece that I wrote in response, which we appreciated. But then shortly after this, we found that the companies that they had essentially been advertising in the piece were both also selling child sex abuse doll brands. So we did a bit of research. We came back to them and said, here's what we found. It's pretty alarming. Perhaps given this information and that you're, you know, directing your readers to illegal child sex abuse material, mm -hmm. you might like to pull the piece. Mm -hmm. And they didn't respond. So after a couple of weeks, we thought, well, we've given them some time. They haven't done anything. So we went public with this information. And that same day, they did respond. Oh, we missed the email. And um, <laughs> so they said, look, we've taken out any mention of those companies. We've added paragraphs from your critical piece to the original piece so that it's more balanced. Uh, so, you know, we considered that a win that I guess this radical feminist analysis did go out to those people and they did edit the piece. But unfortunately, uh, you know, as typically happens when one news media puts something out there, Others take the same story and do their own thing. So it sort of becomes out of control. Mm -hmm. So we had seven news in Australia pick up the story and it was basically their own version of it. It was just this uncritical promotional piece, which again, linked to Rod's 
Instagram account for his sex dolls. Mm. And Rod also had a partnership with a Chinese sex doll company. So he'd offer his followers discount codes and he'd get like a payback. So we had a look at this company and found, surprise, surprise, they also sell child sex abuse dolls, which means Rod had been profiting from and advertising illegal child sex abuse dolls because they're illegal in Australia. Mm. And that Seven News had been advertising and directing people to where they could purchase illegal child sex abuse dolls. So we put on an open letter to Channel 7 on our to Channel 7 News on our blog and we asked why they were promoting and advertising these illegal products. Mm-hmm. And they didn't respond, but they quietly removed the piece and the social media posts. And then from there, uh, the investigation, our, our investigation attracted national news. So we had a, a journalist from News Corp run a story about illegal child sex abuse dolls being advertised on Instagram Mm -hmm. and being sold via Instagram. So as a result of that, Instagram then removed, was it nine accounts, MTR? Yeah, something like that, eight or nine, yeah. Yeah, offering child sex abuse dolls. So these are the wins that we're having like when we are speaking out. But I think it's really important that we connect sex dolls, replica women's sex dolls, to objectification of women, to men's violence against women and pose a question to these media outlets in this day and age, is that something you want to be seen to be on the side of? Do you want to be promoting these products and promoting the objectification of women and, you know, rape culture and all these things? Because I think no one wants to be seen to be doing that these days, even if they are promoting them. That's right. And Caitlin, please also mention the idea we've had about Uh, trying to get uniform laws against uh, child sex abuse dolls, at at least uh, uh, globally. Yeah, that's right. So we've actually had a number of campaigns, successful ones, against platforms selling child sex abuse dolls. We've had child sex abuse dolls pulled from Wish, from Alibaba, from Made in China after our campaigns. Alibaba even went further and uh, geo-blocked the sale of all sex dolls to Australia, which is great. We have an ongoing campaign against Etsy. We have had some wins along the way. We've forced them to remove uh, child sex abuse dolls and replica body parts like replica girl mouths for men's sexual use. Uh, We forced them to take down a listing for black sex dolls, which were marketed as black sex slaves after our campaign. Uh, That's an ongoing campaign. We're continuing to put the pressure on Etsy to get rid of these products. But yes, so next steps, we're now... Uh, collaborating with international partners in a joint campaign to try and criminalise child sex abuse dolls globally because we have these laws in Australia which are good, strong laws, but there's many countries around the world that don't have them. In the US, US, for example, three or four states have criminalised these products, but that means all the rest of them you can import, sell, possess Mm. child sex abuse dolls, even replica infants for men's Mm. sexual use. So we think that's got to change. And that's our next uh, next campaign that we're working on. It is. So if you know any uh, friendly members of parliament in uh, any country, uh, please let us know. We're, we're wanting to get a, an overview, uh, really a, sort of like a literature review, but of legislation of uh, ex- any existing laws and, uh, and laws that don't exist and how we could get Australian laws replicated globally because actually our laws on child sex dolls are actually pretty good. Uh, so yeah big projects but necessary necessary projects so thank you Caitlin Uh, I'll say a little bit about what we're doing on the the uh, global porn industry front this uh, mammoth dispenser of women hatred and misogyny that we are trying to rein in so we uh, are trying to secure a proof of age protections age verification system to put one obstacle in the way of children accessing rape porn, torture porn, sadism, incest, et cetera. Now there's four or five countries that are rolling out this system as we speak. And uh, there's been at least four US states that have said they're going to do that. We are waiting on a report from our e-safety commission, which was due in December and then given a new deadline for this month, which is rapidly running out. Uh, the previous federal government in Australia had instructed e-safety following a parliamentary inquiry that we were a significant part of uh, to come up with a plan. We are waiting for this plan. 
The other thing that we're part of is a global campaign against Pornhub with global partners. Uh, we've seen uh, Pornhub remove millions of videos. Uh, we've seen them hauled before the Canadian Parliament's Ethics Committee because Pornhub uh, is owned by a mind geek, although they've recently had a change of uh, change of ownership to some ethical company, which is just you can't even make this stuff up. Uh, we have also we are also supporting the civil actions against Pornhub. So there's over a hundred civil actions now uh, against Pornhub for non-consensual image sharing, uh, for uh, sharing uh, videos of of women being raped for impl being implicated in, in trafficking, et cetera. So that's a that's a global ongoing campaign to to bring down a porn hub. And this is really the first time I think we've seen an awareness of the harms being caused by by porn and how this industry operates and seeing this industry brought to account and made transparent is 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 very is very positive. And of course we're have an ongoing work with young people, helping them to see how porn will destroy their ability to have healthy, respect-based uh, relationships. So we do quite a lot of education in that space as well. So we continue to fight porn, porn culture, sex dolls, robots, any type of sexualization, objectification uh, of, of women. And we invite you to join us. Collectiveshout.org is our website. We're on all of the social media platforms as well. Caitlin, did you want to say, say anything else? I think we're nearly out of time, but MTR, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you might spend just like a couple of minutes just to give us a bit more insight into your work in schools. Sure. No, I'd love to. Uh, so, yeah, in schools, we talk about how uh, porn and porn culture is having a deforming effect on young people's sexual templates. They're developing sexual templates and uh, we speak to schools as teachers, students, parents, as well as community groups, professional bodies. And, and we argue that uh, you cannot talk about the so-called respect and consent if you're not doing so through a porn critical lens. And unfortunately, many of the organizations that are getting into schools, they've got millions of dollars in government and philanthropic funding to do so, uh, do not uh, support our views on the harms of porn, in fact, a number of them are pro-porn, think that porn can be helpful in educating young people, pro the sex industry, pro kink and bondage, BDSM type practices, uh, even encouraging young people to uh, hire women in the sex industry to learn about uh, sex, sexual technique, uh, even hiring porn performers to talk to boys about consent, which, you know, you just cannot make this up. Uh, one very popular all-male troupe in Australia features a presenter who posts pornographic pictures of himself on his Instagram and then the boys are encouraged to, to follow him. Uh, so it's very important that the porn uh, critical message gets out there uh, because it is being uh, rapidly undermined by other so-called educational, educational groups. So uh, we will continue our differentiated, distinct uh, approach in the hope that we can help more young people to, to choose to, to resist porn porn's toxic scripts for their lives and uh, choose something that'll be much better for, for them and their partners. Mm, that's great. It's, I always love reading the, the messages that you get, you know, when you share messages from young people that you speak to and just how you're able to change their lives, to come in and say, say this stuff that no one else has said that they're allowed to object to this stuff. They don't have to be okay with it. And especially for girls, I feel like the recurring theme is, you gave us permission to say no mm -hmm. because no one has said that to them before that they can say no. They just think, you know, I'm being mean or that they don't even really see it as an option. So for you to go in and actually empower girls mm -hmm. in the correct sense of the word, yes. I think that's that's just so important and so needed. Thanks, Caitlin. It really is a privilege to do to do this work and to to hear young women respond the way they do. And it does give me hope. It actually gets me out of bed every day when young women contact me and, and say that this message changed their lives, that they are allowed to say no. I mean, it's tragic that that should be some kind of major revelation, but it is because the culture undermines their ability to say to say no. And uh, they're, they're a significant reason that we continue to do this work in the hope that we can bring about cultural change and social transformation for, for the good of women and girls, uh, but also ultimately uh, for men and boys and, and the community as a whole.
Mm. All right, well, we might sort of wrap up there. Just um, so we've got my book, Sex Dolls, Robots, and Woman Hating. I don't know if it's backwards to you. Is it backwards? No, it's not backwards to me. Oh, that's good. That must just yeah. be. So this is my yeah. one, Sex Dolls, Robots, and Woman Hating, The Case for Resistance. And MTR's latest book, she's got many other books you can check out, but this is the most recent, He Chose Porn Over Me, Women Harmed by Men Who Use Porn. And these are both available from uh, the great Australian publisher, Spinifex Press. You can find them at spinifexpress.com.au. And if you're in the UK or North America, you can go to the website and there's information about uh, suppliers and where you can access the books as well. So many options but uh, if you're interested in these topics uh, do read these books um, I can say MTRs is is really important it's uh, the first of its kind and it's it's so important these stories are being collected and told so do check out these books well Caitlin's Caitlin's book is uh, first of its kind as, as well it's a pioneering work deeply disturbing work but it has really helped to get this issue on the map on a global scale. And we just hope that our combined combined work will help to supercharge this movement that we're all part of, this global movement. And thanks so much to those of you who have joined, joined uh, the, re, the uh, podcast today. And thanks again for the opportunity to, to share our work with you all. Yeah, thanks for joining. And feel free to uh, look us up at collectorshout.org or all the socials. Thank you. Thanks.